People without strong centralized leadership in different parts of the world have built massive, incredible monumental structures. I don't think we have to assume there must be a powerful leader. Because again, if, if we get, I, I think we often look at these buildings and people say, why would you do it? Who forced you to do it? Well, I think this is again about worldview in the sense that nobody forced, probably here some people were forced, but there's also the sense that nobody forced anyone to build a cathedral. It was an honor. It was an honor to go through that work and build the tower to God and ensure your place in heaven and participate in bringing blessings upon the community. So I don't think it has to be a strong centralized uh, figurehead lording it over people. But I also think that was happening at Chaco and, and these, these things get, get very intertwined, intertwined. So I think there was this dynasty over 300 years in the oral histories of the Diné, they talk about the gambler. And that is talked about as one person, but of course, oral histories again are not, are, are, these stories are coming out of a different worldview and, and ontological perspective. So, so we've begun talking about the gambler more as a, f a title or a role that's held by different individuals over hundreds of years. I like how Rich says it, it's like Pharaoh. It's always the Pharaoh, but the Pharaoh is not always Ramses II. You know, it's Ramses II and Amenhotep and so forth. So we have really clear evidence of social hierarchy here. We have people who are eating better, dwelling within these giant structures. They're um, buried with much more lavish goods. So there's, there's a clear inequality in Chaco. Sometimes the question for me is not like how were they forced to do it or why did they do it but but it's really you couldn't for i don't think you could force people to do this for 300 years but i think there were periods like that as for where's everybody living i mean there's a giant world around us so around the margins of the san juan basin i mean you have everything you don't have in chaco you have mountains with trees you have fertile soils i mean where i spend my summers while doing field work is about an hour south of here hour hour and a half south of here it rains all the time. There's beautiful soil. People still have ranches and farms down there. There's trees galore. I mean, as I'm driving into where I spend the night, there's a big sign, firewood for sale. You don't see a sign about firewood for sale driving into Chaco Canyon. <laughs> You're never gonna see that because there's no trees here and there never were as shown in, in recent, um, recent scientific studies definitely show they never had trees in, in the canyon for thousands of years before people moved in here. So people are living I think, yeah, clearly some people live in the canyon. Some powerful people live in the great houses. Some less powerful people live in the small houses on the other side of the canyon. It's clear, I mean, they have actual middens, trash and people buried in them and so forth. But I think the majority of people involved in this Chaco dream are living outside the canyon and then they come in to to contribute to, to these constructions at, at certain times of year, at uh, certain years, certain maybe astronomical events, who knows? But there, again, I think, I think like the cathedrals, it's, it's an honor. Oh, you get to come contribute your blood, sweat, and tears and, and passion to building structures that are ensuring the cosmos keeps working and ensuring that the mysteries of life remain uh, that your society remains in proper conversation with the mysteries of life. But there's a really clear dark side here. There's a really clear dark side and a really clear downfall. This dark side and this downfall is talked about very clearly in native oral histories, especially coming from, from Navajo, Diné people, but coming as well from, from Pueblos who say, the stories all orbit around a central theme. People at Chaco were abusing their power. They were manipulating the natural forces. They were not living in the way the creator intended. And there was, things got really ugly. And then people transformed their ways of life. So it's a, again, we're, go, we're, we're going back now to these questions of evolutionary anthropology versus history. People made decisions, things happened, you know, 
There was, a, there was a huge role of religion. People were building these buildings. They were tapping into all these powerful animate ent entities. That got corrupted. That got taken too far. People were treated very, very badly. There was, a, there was fights, and I'm sure there were people who wanted to continue the Chaco way of life. There were people who said, no, we're not going to do this anymore. Ultimately, the people who said, we're not going to do this anymore, they won. People, I mean, in terms of Pueblo people, they left this area entirely. The San Juan Basin, I mean, if you look at a distribution of the Pueblos today, and you look at a distribution of the Chaco world, they are perfectly inverse. And I, I, I don't want to say I can guarantee you, but I really don't think that that's a coincidence. That's a conscious decision about a certain way of life here being rejected. Navajo people stayed here. Some Navajo people will tell you that they were entrusted to keep watch over this area where this intense, powerful, and wrong things happened and to safeguard that from happening again. That story doesn't really fit within the bands, tribe, chiefdom, states linear model, but it does fit within history where, th where people make decisions and, and uh, we are really, it's a really, it's a really beautiful story and it's a really powerful story and it's almost too similar to, our, I, I think the parallels to our modern day are almost too similar to even be meaningful. <laughs> I, I don't know how to say it. It's, it's just so striking.